attending this session. Uh, this is the final and the last session uh, of the series called Hallmarks of US Higher Education, which was spreaded from June 9th to July 21st. And I'm sure you must have also attended the past session. Talking about today's uh, session, this is the journey was like, uh, we have started with uh, a session which was on June 9th and today is the last session, which is on the academics to adaptability. Why learning beyond the classroom matters the most today. So welcome to the session from Education USA. Talking about what is Education USA, you must be aware still the, just a bit of it. Uh, education USA is your official source on US higher education and it is supported by the US State Department. Uh, we are here to provide you the accurate, current and comprehensive information. The most important aspect of an Education USA center or an advisor is that they uh, look at your profile unbiasedly and that makes it very unique. Uh, as of now, in today's date, we are more than 430 plus centers uh, in 170 plus countries. And saying that, we all are in more than 550 plus advisors. Uh, in India, we have seven cities and eight centers, uh, four host institutions, which falls in Ahmedabad, Bangalore, Chennai. Hyderabad city has two centers now, Kolkata, Mumbai, and New Delhi. These are the basic five steps which Education USA has come up with, which makes your plan and your timeline very easy when you are thinking to go and study in any of the institutions in the United States, which starts with step one, which is research your options. Uh, second step is finance your studies, followed by complete your application on time because uh, various university has various deadlines to follow. Apply for your student visas once you get in confirmation and admission from a US university. And after you do your visa, it is all about a very smooth pre-departure from India to start your know, journey in the US. You can connect with Education US in uh, you know, all of these matters, like Education US India services falls on these, these kind of various platforms. You can sign up for a regular update uh, by following this link. You can also check out on the uh, chat boxes where my colleague will also paste some useful links and some useful documents that you can download and keep for your further references. You can explore our calendar events, which is a part of the All India events so virtually. As of now, we are working virtually. So all the uh, events and the sessions are happen happening virtually, which gives you the best chance to join in from any part of the world. You can also talk to us on our toll-free number, Monday to Friday, 10 to 5 p.m. You can also be a part of the Ask an Advisor virtual talk, which gives you more in-depth information and also answers your questions, which are related to these five steps of US studies. We also offer individual advising memberships. You can get in touch with the respective center, which is the nearest center to you, and you can know more about it. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, so you can follow our pages. Uh, all our past sessions of this series is a kind of library resources available on our Facebook page, as well as our YouTube page. The name of these two pages are Education USA India. Very easy and very compact, right in your hand. You can also download our Education USA India mobile app, which is both Google and App Store friendly. It's a very minimal size app. You can download the app. You, there is a chatbot on the app, and you can also get your answer questions answered by the chatbot. Also, you'll have more details about all of these uh, steps that we were talking about. You can follow our YouTube channel with this name and also check our playlist, which has immensely resourceful videos available. Our past sessions have been recorded for your future references, so do check them out. Uh, this is another series that we are going with right now, which are uh, Education USA Prepathon series, which are known and created for the admitted students who are joining the US universities in the fall 2021. Uh, you can just check out or you can take a screenshot of this uh, particular slide, which will give you an idea that which session falls on which date. And please join in uh, you know, for this particular session if you are really going and you are joining any US institutions this year. So here we go. So I would like to welcome our speakers for today. Our speakers are Thi Nijain. Uh, he is from Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago. Welcome Thi to the session and thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Our other speaker is Holly Singh. He is from Arizona State University 
And it's a pleasure only to have you here for this particular session. And thank you for accepting our invitation. And without passing any time, I would now pass it to Holly. Holly, it's over to you. Please share your screen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. Um, thank you for, uh, for introducing us. Uh, Ty, before I share, uh, T, sorry, T, before I share my screen, uh, if you want to just quickly introduce yourself, I want our, our participants to know you, and then I, I'll introduce myself and then share the screen. Thank you, Holly. Well, it's great uh, to have everyone uh, join in today, and I'm delighted to, to really see the participation. So again, my name is Tina Nguyen, and I'm Associate Vice Provost for Student Engagement and Career Services at the Illinois Institute of uh, Technology in, in Chicago. Um, it's a lovely day in Chicago today. I think it's about 20 degrees um, Celsius, um, which, uh, which is unusual uh, to be this, this lovely this time of year. Um, but a little bit about my background, I oversee the areas of career services, uh, campus life and residence life. So a lot of um, what I think in the US we would consider some of the student affairs functions or um, student life functions at uh, the university. Um, I've got about 20 plus years of experience in uh, career services, uh, including time at Northwestern University and University of Illinois at, at Chicago. And um, much of my background has been spent actually advising and coaching, working with students in STEM related fields, as well as uh, employers around the country and, and globally. And so that's a little bit about me and I'll uh, turn it over to Holly. Thank you, T. I really, really appreciate you uh, doing this. I think. I think our, our participants need, need to understand our own backgrounds, where we come from, because we're not isolated as presenters. I mean, we are part of you. you know, we've always been part of you because of our, our own backgrounds. Uh, just to give you an idea about myself, I, uh, in fact, grew up in New Delhi, and I uh, came to States as an international student. And, uh, and you know, about uh, in the last millennium or you know, 30 years back, uh, I was a student and uh, went through uh, uh, the bachelor's and master's degrees from, a, in fact, a, an institution close to uh, Thai's area in, in Chicago. And, um, and I've been at, uh, at uh, Arizona State University for the last six years. I, my, my main work is with international students. I oversee our international students at Scholar Center. But before that, I was uh, a student as well. So, so those, those international student days, don't, we don't forget those. Those are you know, critical in our, in our development as, as who we are. Um, and, and I think it's very, very important as, as new admits, as, as students, um, as you are starting this journey to really look at it and, and take full advantage of what you will be experiencing. And this is where both uh, T and I are gonna talk about that you know, these experiences are what are going to define you. And as Janet clearly said that this last session is about um, things outside of the class because life happens outside of the class. I think it's critical that you take advantage of this. And the reason we are really talking about this is there's a lot that happens outside of the class. And, and if you really look at it, uh, there, there is... Uh, there are opportunities that need to be taken advantage of. So while I'm gonna just give you an overview of you know, uh, employment opportunities with CPT and OPT, uh, T is gonna go more into details about the career support and you know, things that happen in career services. And both of us are gonna talk about other things that are critical for your development as an international student. Uh, let me start by first saying, you know, what you're experiencing, what I experienced as an international student, what any and every international student experiences uh, from different levels. I am pretty sure that uh, you are excited about uh, your journey to US. I'm pretty sure you're nervous at the same time about your journey to US. Uh, many of you are a bit scared as well for some reason that this is probably your first time ever going to US. Many of you uh, are to an extent, something we call the honeymoon stage, that you are at a level of excitement that um, you know, is sometimes difficult to, to define. 
Um, but then you will, within the two, three, four months time, may also um, go into a slight depression because you'll be missing home. You'll be missing your mom's food. You'll be, you'll be missing your friends. Uh, and I think for you to understand what you are experiencing is critical. And we call it the intercultural adjustment cycle. That as you're entering a new culture, you're trying to adjust to that new culture. And it takes time and it has ups and downs. But for you to just refer back to this conversation with us and say, ah, this is what I'm experiencing, I think is, is important. Because that's how you will, to an extent, cope with this. That you know, you will have your fellow Indian students around you and you guys will create that little India, whether it's in IIT or ASU or any other place, uh, any other university in the US. But for you, for you to know what you're going through, this emotional uh, roller coaster, I think is, is important. And, and you can always refer back to saying, oh, this is the intercultural adjustment cycle that when I was coming to US, when I was preparing, when I was listening to this Education USA presentations, I was at a honeymoon stage. I was at a high stage because I had already gotten the visa. I had my travel plans. I was planning my orientation and arrivals in big cities like Chicago and Phoenix. And then, you know, when I settled down, I had my apartment and I was into classes, you know, into the semester for two months. I was feeling low. Well, you were feeling low, not because something is wrong, but because you were at a high when you were coming into a new culture. And new culture will have its own added um, benefits and disadvantages uh, because you will find people doing things differently than you are. And, and you were taught your culture to an extent as an absolute value. And whereas when you come to a new culture, you find out that it's very relative, that Americans do things differently, that the Chinese do things differently, that the Vietnamese do things differently, the students from the Middle East do things differently. But at the same time, you know, it's still part, it's still part and parcel of culture. So again, this is not the topic that we want to delve on, but that's something I think both T and I feel that you, know, you need to know as you adjust uh, your new life into a new culture. So um, I'm gonna talk, and I'm gonna just introduce the subject because T has the, um, the background and the ability to go into you know, the, the career services. So my goal here would be to talk about employment to an extent, and then uh, we go deeper into career services, and then later on to other subjects that we can talk. So uh, given you are all coming on F1 or J1 visas, those are student uh, visas, there are rights and benefits that go with it. The first right that you have is that you're allowed to work on campus. And one of the first non-rights that you have, the one of the things that you cannot do is you cannot work off campus unless you have the right uh, approvals for that. So understand that you can work on campus as an international student up to 20 hours a week and 40 hours or full time when the school is not in session. But working off campus, you can do it in two different ways. One is called a curricular practical training, training, CPT, and the other was called optional practical training, OPT. And um, there's, there are differences there and it's very, very important for you to understand those differences. So those differences are based on what the federal regulations are that mandate you know, different things for F1 students. And sometimes those differences are also dependent from school to school, how those schools implement those regulations by the US government. And that again, something that T and I will discuss further so you can understand those better because the regulation may say one thing, and then how it's interpreted and how it's regulated by different schools is, could look very, very different. So try not to compare notes with other students from other universities because you may say, oh, oh, Purdue students can do this or, oh, students from UCLA can do this or 
UT Austin lets them do this, you know. So sometimes it can look different, but the federal regulations are the same, you know, for both CPT and, and OPT. So CPT, curricular practical training, OPT, optional practical training. And the words curricular and optional are critical for you to understand what those mean. So curricular basically means that it is something that's part of your academic program. So part of an academic program could mean that it's part of your degree. So your degree may allow you uh, a certain benefit of a certain internship while the degree next door or a degree in your own school in another uh, school may not allow certain provisions. So it's very, very degree specific, very department specific, very school specific, very college specific. So for you to understand that is very, very important. So CPT usually falls after you've done two academic semesters of, of uh, uh, classes. So if you're starting in fall 2021, the earliest you can probably use CPT to work off campus um, would be summer of 2022 because you would have fall and spring semesters to take first before you can use CPT. And again, CPT is curricular practical training. That means it has to be related to your major. So you can only work in the field of your study. Very, very important. You can't, you can't just say, oh, you know, I have a mechanical engineering degree, but I want to work in, in Walmart or I want to, you know, work in McDonald's and, you know, serve burgers. No. Yes, you can work at McDonald's, but you can, if you have a computer science background, it has to be related to computer science. If you, you could work at Walmart, but if you are a mechanical engineering major, then it has to be related to mechanical engineering. So that's very, very important. And then how we manage the curricular side about of it is that you have to be enrolled in an internship course. Again, more details from T once, once we talk about that. So, so it, CPD is well organized and understand it's not really an employment per se. It is the training part that is critical and that's what needs the, need the focus on. So um, employment that you have on campus, for example, that could be in anything. So you could work in my office, you could work in T's office, you can work in cafeteria, you can work in any different place and it need not be related to your major. But when it comes to CPT, when it comes to internships that are off campus, then they have to be related to your major. It's very, very important. And the focus moves away from just employment for money's sake, but employment to gaining some practical knowledge that helps you on your journey, uh, your academic journey. Okay, so moving it to, to that part. So that's again, uh, uh, critical. Um, so I think we've talked enough about the CPT part and you know, I'll, I'll come back to it if, if need be, but let's, let's move to uh, the, the OPT part too. CPT is also, um, before we go to OPT, CPT is also limited to 12 months of, um, full-time CPT. And if you go beyond 12 months of CP, full-time CPT, then you lose the um, OPT provisions. So again, very, very important how you plan CPT. So a scenario could happen that come summer of 2022, after you've done two academic semesters, you get an opportunity to work part-time or even full-time in a, in a company that you know, really like and, and a major and a field of experience that's related to your major. And that company says, you know, you could work for the following fall, fall of 2022, in a part-time fashion with the same company. Now, that's not guaranteed by the school. So your summer 2022, for example, was, you know, you were given the right documents by the, uh, the international office, by the career services to work does not mean that that can continue on fall of 2022, that you have to go through the whole process again. And it's possible that you may or may not be uh, approved by the career services or by the international office. So it's very important that every semester you check and, and go through the paperwork to be approved for that. Okay. Um, optional practical training. So this is where I, 
I can uh, spend some more time uh, because curricular again was part of your uh, degree program and was during your degree. So I'll take an example here. Say you are a computer science major, yeah, you know, it's two years degree, although you have an I-20 that may say three years because that's what it's possible a school may have given you. Doesn't mean that you have three years to complete that degree. Doesn't mean that you can be, you're okay for three years. No, if your degree is for two years, you're good for two years only. You know, so that's, that's again, very, very important for you to understand. Just because your I-20 dates give you three years, doesn't mean that you have three years. Just because your visa gives you five years, doesn't mean you have five years to finish your degree. If your degree ends in a year and a half or needs to be ended in a year and a half, then that's your time. But if you add the curricular practical training or CPT is part and parcel of your degree program, then you have that summer or you have that fall or spring to work uh, off campus and, and be part of your degree program. So CPT is curricular in nature. Curricular basically means you know, academically oriented. OPT is not that different from that, but it's optional. That means it's usually something that's a benefit uh, closer to when you finished your degree. So for example, your major in a school that you're going to say does not allow CPTs, does not allow the internship. You could do OPT or optional practical training uh, pre-graduation. Before you graduate, you may be able to take some of that one year that you're allowed as a non-STEM major or one year allowed that's for every, uh, every international student. You can take part of that and you can do pre-completion OPT. Um, more details on that, but I think we don't, we don't have to go into that yet. We will probably answer questions uh, in detail. So optional practical training for all good purposes is something that you do after you graduate. So you have to, this, you have to apply to USCIS or United States um, uh, CIS. Uh, it's, it's a department in the, in the Department of Homeland Security, uh, US Citizen and Immigration Services. So they are the ones who issue you your, your employment card. And that's how you have particular time from a start date to an end date where you can work um, off campus. Again, has to be in your field of study. Very, very important, has to be in, the, in your field of study. And STEM majors get an additional 24 months. Uh, but those 24 months of work uh, could look very different the from the 12 months of work that you're allowed um, uh, right after graduation. And this has to be again planned because it takes USCIS three months to issue your documents. Very different than CPT. CPT is a benefit that we in the international office or career services offices can internally issue you. We don't have to go to USCIS to to give you that benefit. And we just make the note in your I-20 and you have a new I-20, a new CPT I-20. And that clearly says that you're approved for this, this much time from this date to this date for this particular company. And then you're good to go with that. OPT on the other hand is planned because you probably have to apply three months before your start date for this company. And you don't really need that, uh, that um, start date per se, or that company employment to begin with. Uh, CPT is very company specific, very employment specific, very focused on when you start and when you end, and you have to have that before we can approve it. Whereas optional practical training is more like a, a work permit that you get, you know, like a, a, a something which has a start date and end date, but no employment or no employer in particular in mind when you get that uh, provision. Again, we will re revisit this as, as T and I you know, discuss further things later on when he starts presenting on his side. And uh, as I said that you can get 24 months of uh, STEM OPT on top of the 12 months of OPT. Uh, more, uh, more, more details with that and we will, we will talk more about that as well. Uh, there are, there are things in, in pre-completion OPT that you need to be mindful of. And it is very important for you to understand. 
for both CPT and OPT. There's only so much that uh, international offices and career services can tell you in terms of what your rights and obligations. It is very important that you keep on top of what is okay and what is not okay. It is important that you um, understand the regulations and try not to try to be more conservative in uh, in what is acceptable. And the reason I say that is that many of you want to have a longer career in the US. Many of you probably plan to later on go on a work visa like H-1B or L-1 visa. And many of you possibly may want to apply for permanent residency uh, so you can keep working in the US. So for that to continue, you know, those documentations have to, again, go back to USCIS to be approved. And they can look back to your CPT and OPT time and say, okay, why were you, why did you do this? Or why did you do that? So those questions can always come. So that's why I think it's important for you to be conservative in what you do in terms of your employment during CPT and OPT, then take too many risks in, in, you know, in, in uh, working up above and beyond what you've been approved to. It, it, at the time when you're doing it, it doesn't look like a big, big thing, but when it comes to your documentation for H-1B and for your permanent residency, that may come to bite you back. So that's again, very important to be, to be uh, a little more, uh, uh, you know, uh, concerned about that. Anyways, uh, more details on both post-completion and pre-completion OPTs, because that's how you can do it. And there are things that you can and cannot do when you, when you do the employment. Again, uh, the slides are a bit more in detail because we want you to know that it's not simply just CPT and OPT. There, there, are, there are things that you have to be always be, uh, be uh, aware of because at the end of the day, you know, you can't say, oh, well, career services approved you for this. And, oh, the international office approved you for that. Yes, we approved you for that because we had our internal policies to, uh, to approve you. But the USCIS can come back and ask questions about different things too. And, and of course, we will support you for sure. We will definitely support you. But USCIS has the right to ask questions and say, okay, yes, this doesn't seem right or this doesn't seem uh, appropriate for the uh, approval that was given to the student. Um, more details on the 24 months uh, STEM extension. The one difference that I could talk um, in detail about OPT and STEM OPT is that uh, the companies that you work for have to be e-verified. That's one thing. The second of all, when you were doing your first OPT or your 12 month OPT, you could have worked for yourself. You could have done, you could have gone for a startup. You could have, uh, you know, uh, volunteered and, and, and done project-based uh, learning. But none of that is, is applicable in a 24 month STEM OPT. You have to, you have to have a, a job with a particular uh, work that's, that's more uh, organized to an extent. So in that way, uh, what is unacceptable is any of the volunteer and unpaid positions. Uh, you know, you can't do self-employment and you cannot be uh, part-time work. Uh, so uh, the, you'll have plenty of time to, to learn and understand all this uh, with, with the training that you will go through. Uh, but, but I think it's it, what the most important thing that I can tell you uh, in this is that it's your responsibility to know the regulations. It's, it's your responsibility. While, while you know, T and his team and my, me and my team can really help you guide through that, it is critical that you know what your rights and benefits are uh, in the F1 uh, student status provision. So uh, more when we talk further, but I, at this point, I wanna um, give it up to T so he can walk us through the career services and how we'll you know, take an in-depth view of uh, what career services has to offer. And then uh, you know, how that, that would help in your own journey uh, with uh, all the experiences that you should get as, a, as an international student. 
and the learning that you need to do outside of the class. And it, some, for some of this, th this might be a bit uh, foreign, uh, very different than the in institutions that you've learned at um, back in India. And, and for you to really understand the student services that we offer in the US in different institutions is important too, because there's so much of, hap so much of, so much of stuff happening on colleges beyond the classrooms that that can, that can really be overwhelming as well. So that over understand that the first three, four, five months time, the first semester, first year will be overwhelming as you understand and learn different things in, in US institutions. Um, Thank you for giving me time to talk and we would do, we'd love to do the Q&A later on and I give it up to T, our, our expert in the, in the career services area. All right, well, thank you, Holly. That was very much, very, very informative and, and educational. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of knowing the regulations when, um, especially when it comes to CPT and OPT. And uh, I'm going to definitely be going into those topics uh, in, in, in depth as it relates to career services. But what the one thing I want to emphasize, and Holly, I think you set it up well, is every institution does it a little bit differently as well. So we can share some information with you, but one of the most important things to do is to get to know your advisors, especially within uh, the international centers and career services at the respected universities or schools that you, you will be attending. Um, many, if not all, will be offering sessions on CPT and OPT. So it's really important to attend those sessions early on during your, your academic career so that you are knowledgeable and you understand how the processes work within the individual schools. Because we're, we're, you know, both of us are talking about um, things at, at a little bit of a higher level. But again, when it comes to how the school interprets the, these processes, it can look a little bit different. And it's really important for you to understand those, those nuances. So, so I'm going to be talking um, a little bit more in depth about the career services side of things when it comes to CPT and OPT, but also how career services provide support to, uh, to students, to international students in, in particular. So much of my career has actually been spent, you know, actually advising and, and coaching students in STEM related fields, but also international students. And, um, and, and I think, you know, the first thing to really consider when it comes to career services is that it's, it's very distinct um, and it's often a part of uh, the university and it can be housed in many different areas. So for example, at IIT, because uh, we're a little bit of a smaller university, career services serves the majority of students at the university as well. Um, we do have a dedicated career center for our students who are studying business and we work very closely uh, together. But as an example, if you go to a larger university, there may be um, multiple career services offices. So let's, uh, for example, say that you are studying um, a particular area in engineering. It is possible that there is going to be a dedicated engineering career center in addition to a centralized career center. And in some cases, you may be able to utilize both as well. But where it gets a little bit confusing, to be honest, because I've done both uh, as far as the offices I've worked in is, is knowing who's actually managing the CPT process and um, who's going to be knowledgeable about the C CPT process. It's, it's, so for example, at IIT, we have a dedicated CPT advisor. Within another university, CPT processes may exist within um, an engineering career center. So it's really important to understand those distinctions and to, to ask the, the right questions. But regardless of how it's structured, what you can expect from career services are, are a few things. One, is high quality individual career coaching to meet your career development goals and needs. And I really wanna emphasize the, the coaching and advising aspect here because in, in, in the US and at most universities, there is going to be a career advisor or advisors that, that are going to be able to work with you both on an on a individual level, but also in many cases, they'll be providing group workshops and different programs as well. Some of them will tie into CPT and OPT, but others will be very specific to uh, 
to things you need to know to be successful in your internship or job search. Um, and I'll be talking about those things um, down the road. But one of one of the things that I that that is really hard to to explain in 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 a slide deck is the importance of um, what advisors do, and that is really helping you understand those cultural nuances um, in navigating the job search as well. So there will be particular cultural nuances in terms of the job search and, and the, the job of the advisors to help you navigate that, that process, um, but also to be aware of all the timelines as well, um, because it can definitely vary from industry and sector. So that's very important to, to consider. The other, the other piece to consider is um, what career services offers is networking opportunities and engagement with employers. So many, many universities will bring employers to campus or these days to campus and virtually as well. And, and uh, they, they, they can come in many forms, which, which I'll talk about more in depth. It can come in the form of panel discussions where we have a panel of experts representing different companies talking about a topic. It can come in the form of what we call an information session where, where a group of representatives from a company will be talking about job or internship opportunities at the company, or in some cases, they'll take an in-depth look at a technical aspect of the company as well. It can also kind of come in the form of on-campus interviews where employers will actually be setting up first round interviews within um, the university, often within the career center, within dedicated interview rooms or around the, the university. And it, it and certainly can come in the form of career fairs or job fairs, which I'll be talking about in, in just a little while. But again, um, it can really vary in terms of what the career services offices offer. But for the most part, you'll see very comprehensive career services, which is a combination of advising, coaching, and offering the opportunities to, to engage with, with employers. So that is something to, to expect as well, I think, no matter where you go um, when studying in, in the US. So let's talk a little bit about CPT and OPT. And Holly really, again, set it up well in terms of understanding your requirements. This is so key. Um, I want to start with, with curricular practical training and CPT as it relates to career services and, and, and the job search and also timelines to, to be aware of. So um, the, the, the job search timeline can really vary by, by sector and industry. So, for example, um, I'm just going to use one example. Let's say that you are um, an incoming master's degree student at a university studying a particular um, discipline in, in engineering. Um, you're not eligible yet for critical or practical training because as Holly stated, you need two, two academic semesters um, of study before you can apply for CPT, right? And the, the curricular practical training is going to be attached to that job offer that you'll be uh, hopefully obtaining. However, your job search, your, or your internship search in this particular case would start probably in the fall semester. So even though you're not yet qualified cur cur curricular practical training, you're gonna be starting your search in that fall semester. And that's gonna happen through the advising, through the tools that are available, potentially through a career fair and on-campus interviews, because I'll talk about it from the company perspective. The companies will, in some cases be trying to really get offers out and secured, secured by a certain month in the fall semester, even for summer. So it really depends upon the field and industry. So there are some companies um, and it, it will seem accelerated that will try to have offers extended in November, even October in some cases of your first semester of study. And so you're not eligible yet for curricular practical training but you may have that offer as well. So, so that's something to really keep in mind in terms of the timelines. And this is again, gonna be very, very, very much by industry and sector. In some cases, there's other companies that will not start um, their searches for candidates until the spring semester. And, and so you, you really will have to navigate that process. And that's where the advisors and uh, career coaches can really be helpful in helping you um, navigate that, that process. The other thing to consider with CPT, curricular practical training specifically, 
is the dates as well. So curricular is just that it, it's related to your area of study. And so in many cases, both the career center and the international center, sometimes in conjunction with one another, sometimes it may just happen from the international center, um, they will set dates in which you can work use, utilizing your curricular, curricular practical training. So at IIT, we have very specific dates. I'll use summer as an example for when you can start CPT in the summer and when that end date is as well. And you have to fall within those dates to utilize your CPT. And so you really want to be aware of those dates going in as well, because I've seen this happen. In some cases, you may be, you know, you may have secured an offer um, from an employer and you, you um, negotiated or were offered a start date. That start date doesn't correspond with this, the, the dates um, that you, the university has for CPT in the summer. So let's say um, if you're in a semester-based school that you secured a start date of, I'll just use an example, of May 16th um, of 2022. I don't know what exact day that is, but I'll just use that as an example. The university doesn't have CPT start until May 27th. So you're gonna really, so in that case, you would have to come back to the employer and really work with them in terms of, um, in terms of uh, negotiating a new start date as well. So to avoid that, that headache, know your dates ahead of time as well. So you can share that with the employer because an employer is not going to be aware in most cases of the CPT dates and when, when uh, those dates are. Um, in some cases they are, and I certainly have worked with employers and helping them understand that, but in many cases they are not as well. So the other thing you know, that I wanna share when it comes to curricular practical training is related to the area of study. This has become much more complicated over the years as we've seen the rise of startups and um, different opportunities and so forth. And, and I think on you know, either the International Center, um, an academic advisor or a career advisor will really be taking a hard look at that job offer that you're getting as well. Because we to, because we, we understand the importance of staying within the regulations and staying within compliance. So we want to make sure that whatever you are pursuing and when you have that internship offer, it relates to your area of study. So we, we will be taking, you know, I think most career centers or other offices will be taking a close look at that job offer and asking questions as well, particularly if we're not familiar with that company or that, um, or that particular position. Because, because of the vastness of the market, um, even if we just break it down to Chicago and the Phoenix area, these are very large metropolitan areas with numerous companies and um, opportunities. And there is no way that any of us can really grasp or understand all the opportunities that are available. The metro areas are just too big to be able to, to, to do that, just as, as an example, let alone the United States. And so we will be asking some questions to make sure that things align as well, um, that uh, the university is staying within compliance, that you are staying within compliance, because in the end, we do want to protect you as well. And so um, we do take a hard look at those offers and we'll ask some questions as well um, when it comes to curricular practical training. Um, optional practical training, you know, brings a, a whole level of, of nuance as well. And it gets particularly tricky, I think, um, when it comes to deciding your start date for optional practical training, particularly if you, you do not have a job offer in hand. Um, so, it, it, it's going to be important to work with your coaches and advisors to really understand that that process as well, because you know, as, as Holly stated, you do have to apply for OPT in advance, and it doesn't necessarily have to be connected to a job offer as well. And coming into the university, you really want to be able to navigate both CPT and OPT, understand those distinct areas uh, to decide what you really want to utilize or have an idea of what you want to utilize in your area of study. Typically, from my experience, I see most students utilizing curricular practical training during their studies um, at the university and then utilizing optional practical training following their areas of study. But that's not always the case, as Holly stated. So, so it really can be related to your area of study, the college within the university that you're studying as well. So really understanding those requirements is really key. The reality is you have 
a couple additional layers that you have to consider in regard to, to your job search. The other thing I want to share, and, and, uh, and this is um, true for both curricular practical training and optional practical training, and I often tell this to students, is you really want to become the experts in these particular areas. Some employers will really understand curricular practical training and optional practical training well that you meet with. Others will not. And when you're meeting with an employer for the first time, let's say it's, a, it's at a career fair, you may need to um, briefly explain those processes to them as well. The fact that you actually do qualify for curricular practical training or optional practical training and be ready to make those referrals, especially back to the International Center or Career Services so that the career centers can work with the employers to help them understand that, that process. That is something that, that I, I do on a regular basis. And I've worked with numerous companies over the past couple of years, as an example of IIT, to help them understand that, yes, you can actually hire this individual on optional practical training or on curricular practical training. This is what we do to help you do that. And particularly with some smaller companies, they didn't um, have that knowledge um, of that process um, because they were just starting off. You know, they were. They had a lot of, uh, for example, seed money to get things going. They had a product ready to go, but um, they didn't understand these processes. So we had to actually help them navigate that process. But in many cases, we, we're not gonna be there when you're having that first conversation with that employer. So be ready to make that referral um, and explain it in a way um, that hopefully the employer will be able to understand and ask the right questions um, so that we can work with those companies as well so, they, so that you have that opportunity because Sometimes, in some cases, some companies will think that it's immediately not possible when it could be. Now, in some cases, it may not be possible, and you want to understand that as well. But know that, the, again, it's very nuanced, and that there are experts that are uh, ready to support you when it comes to both curricular practical training and optional practical training. And uh, I know there'll be some questions about this, and we'll, go, uh, we'll take a deeper um, dive in, into this. So... What I like to think about when it comes to career development, career services, is that hopefully career services and the International Center are working hand in hand. Um, but this can vary from school to school in terms of how, um, how the, the centers are organized and where they're located within the university. But you're gonna have to be, utilize both um, to really be, be success, successful. So the career services will be providing the career support, the advising, Within my department, within career services, um, we, we do have a dedicated um, CPT advisor at an assistant director position who will be reviewing the offers and actually doing the, the actual uh, internship enrollment and things like that. But that can really vary from university to university. The International Center um, is actually located uh, for us is located right with career services. So that allows that partnership to, to really happen. And they're gonna help us um, understand the processes, the changes that may occur and, and all those things. And then we're gonna work together to provide some joint programming as well. Um, but again, this can really vary. And I think in the end, you're gonna really be, um, you're gonna need to utilize both offices um, in order to be successful. And the important thing that I wanna emphasize is don't wait to the, until the last minute as well. Um, to utilize both offices. Um, when you're starting off, I think that first semester, once you get situated, is a time to really start meeting with those uh, uh, advisors within the offices to understand what they can provide. Start attending those workshops early on um, so you can understand the processes too, because uh, that's gonna be really helpful when it comes to, to your search. So you can really put all those pieces of the puzzle together because in a way it is a, it is a little bit of a puzzle. Not only do you have to get that offer, but you have to be able to understand the, the, um, the CPT and OPT processes. And just one moment here, um, I'm gonna pause. I just realized that my uh, computer is not plugged in. So my apologies for this. And as, okay. as he continues on, I just want to quickly say that one thing that both he and I want to make it very clear is that planning <laughs> and education is central to CPD. Yes. Very, very central to you to planning and, and, and education. Yeah, yeah. My apologies. I'm going to stop my video 
and plug in. So uh, Holly, feel free to take over for a couple minutes. So. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's it's one thing that that I think everybody has to understand that uh, if you think that your your department and the career services and the international center are in control and they can guide you, well, that's well and good. But it's your journey and your uh, your uh, your unique journey that's critical. So. So I'll give you an example. While both uh, T and I are in the international office and in the career services, the CPT is critically your academically related benefit. So the journey for that really has to start in your department, okay? So, so T and I can't do much un unless the department approves the first step that yes, this off-campus uh, employment benefit is related to your degree program and is approved for that. Once that hurdle is crossed, then your relationship with career services, international office, and the employer is defined. The employer at the end of the day is the one who has to give you an, a position that both career services and international office can approve because it has a relationship with the uh, uh, with the department and it is approved by department. Um, so so as T mentioned that while that benefit is co only coming, so for example, in summer of 2022, after two academic semesters, the planning is critical towards that. So that planning part is what you have to do because your journey is unique. Your, your department may serve thousands upon thousands of students, but it's, it's your, your uh, plan that puts CPT in the center. Back to you, T. Yeah, I'm so sorry about that. I've had a family visiting um, for the past few days and uh, I've kept being shifted around and uh, I had uh, difficulty finding my, my, uh, my plug-in, but I did. So uh, thank you for, for your patience there. Um, uh, but I'm sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but can you please uh, put your slides on the slideshow mode? Sure, sure. Thank you. Yep, let me try that again. So. Sorry about that, I'm having some difficulties here, but hopefully you can see it. Uh, okay, okay, so while T puts this uh, through, I wanna just quickly uh, walk you through what a typical uh, internship or CPD opportunity might look like. T, just just stop me when, when you're ready, okay? Okay, so can you see, my, can you come see to, my slides now? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Yeah, I don't know what is happening. I may need some support here for the slides as well, so. I can share the slides, T, for you. Okay, thank you. So as, as this comes up, um, so for example, you start your journey in fall 2021, you work with career services and the international office and your department approves you to, um, to do an internship possibly in summer. So it's part of your, your academic program, so that's well and good. Now you have to find an employer before you know you can apply for uh, CPT um, approvals from the career services or international offices. You can't wait till the summer for that. You know, probably sometime in January or February, you have to have that lined up. So you need to give departments like career services and international offices to process documents, and that could take 
10 business days or 15 business days. So you can't wait till May to, uh, to give that, uh, you know, that, oh, I have found the employment. So that should be done sometime in March, April. So by May, you have the uh, approval. Back to you, T. Okay, thank you, Holly, for uh, providing that support. That's the first time that's ever happened. So again, you know, as Holly alluded to, it's, it's important to really um, come in early and, and not wait until the last minute. Uh, feel free to, to go to the next slide. So one of the things that, that we often talk and that we often discuss in career services is, is the importance of getting career ready. And career ready means a couple of different things. It means one, gaining the experience um, that you're looking for uh, in order to, for example, get that full-time position. Because as Holly stated, many of you may have aspirations of working in the United States for a certain mm -hmm. duration following graduation or post-graduation. And so that's gonna require a number of things to be able to get to that point in time. And this is where career services, I think, can really help you. And so it can happen in a lot of different ways. One is uh, certainly working on campus. Um, working on campus, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits outside of making uh, some additional money. Um, you can gain some additional skill sets, maybe get familiar with um, the uh, work culture within um, an American campus, but also gain some additional skills, either through research, learning different programs and things like that. I know within the various departments that I manage, um, we hire a number of international students. It's probably the majority or more than half of our uh, student employees are international. And they do a lot of different things for us. It runs the gamut from um, managing what we call a welcome desk uh, for, um, to help answer questions for visitors to um, helping us collect data and, and really um, analyzing some data for us when it comes to career outcomes. Uh, to working in our residence halls. So it can really vary um, from uh, campus to campus as far as the jobs that are available. But the great news is you, know, you are eligible for these opportunities in most cases right away for up to uh, 20 hours per week. Um, but I will say that um, you are a student first and it is really important to consider the academic study um, as well. That should come first because if you're not excelling academically, uh, it's gonna be a problem as well. So just remember, despite these opportunities, um, the academics should should come first. But um, when we talk about beyond the classroom, this will allow you to enhance those experiences. If you're able to really navigate and manage those processes, you know, I think it's going to allow you to be a very desirable candidate uh, for future positions. I'll talk a little bit more about Handshake and different um, uh, technology options that are available within career centers as well and how they can help you. Um, many career centers will offer accelerated career programs. So at my prior institution, we offered something we called a, a boot camp, where within um, two days, you got a lot of information um, to really help you prepare for, uh, for that internship and, and job search. And then other, um, other um, Career centers will offer very specialized career programs. We have one uh, called Elevate at IIT, and most will offer career fairs as well. Now, career fairs have changed over the past year. Um, it used to be, on most campuses, career fairs were very large and offered you know, hundreds of employers. Let's say you were, at, especially at a campus like ASU or even at IIT, you could have 150 employers in an, any given day uh, for a career fair. But since the pandemic, many have now have gone virtual. And I'll talk about that in just a little while too. Uh, feel free to go to the next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about career advising, what that means. So there's this individual advising aspect of things. And um, what you may actually be able to obtain is more of a dedicated career advisor who is working with you and helping you prepare those documents for the search. This often starts with the resume. Um, and there are some very specific nuances to consider, excuse me, with the resume. The resume will really, in many ways, need to be written for the employer or the sector that you are applying for. And that employer will, and that, I'm sorry, that advisor will really help you 
understand that process so that the resume is um, ready to be submitted to that employer for that for that uh, position. Because unfortunately, career services, we're not in the position where we can say, you have to hire this particular student. It is up to you to obtain that, that job. But we want to help you navigate that that process and give you the tools to, to do that. So it often starts with the resume, um, which is part of the document preparation side of things. The other aspect is really related to the employment advising as well, um, which is um, really what to expect. Let's say you secure a position, what to expect when going to that position as well. Um, ways to help you navigate those expectations, because it can be different than what's expected in, in the classroom. Going back to the preparation side, we often provide interview prep, and um, that's going to be an important key key skill as well. So, what the the one thing I really want to mention about interview prep is, you can be an expert, let's say, in computer science, uh, aerospace engineering, and, and really have that that subject matter knowledge. That's great, but can you translate that to the employer? in an interview or during a job fair when you have five minutes to really convey why you're interested in a position or an area. And what career advisors can help you do is to help you articulate that as well. And this often comes to interview preparation uh, because interviewing is not necessarily a natural skill. And, and what career advisors will do is to help you really articulate your experiences, your skills in a way that's going to make sense to the employer. Because in the end, even when it comes to an internship or a full-time position, the employers are really going to be thinking about really how you can benefit them as an organization. Yes, it's a learning opportunity, and they have programs structured as an internship or co-op, but it is still coming down to what do you know going into it so that you can also help them as well. And so that's what career services can help you do um, to, to really help you articulate that, especially when it comes to, to interviews. Uh, next slide. So let's talk a little bit about career fairs because these have changed um, over the past year. So I think most career centers uh, from the research I've done and the organizations and associations that I've seen are going to be offering two types of career fairs going into to the fall semester. The majority I would say are going to be virtual now. So things have changed where we're using various platforms to offer virtual career fairs. And, the, and these are different from in-person career fairs in that you'll have to really do, you'll have to sign up for particular interview slots or slots, scheduling slots ahead of time. And you've always had to research employers, but this is gonna require a little bit more work actually um, to, to be able to understand who's attending, what they're offering and so forth. The, the great news is all that information is there as well. But in many ways, it's almost as though you're signing up for a mini interview we call it a career fair, but in some cases there are really many interviews you're having with employers in a virtual environment. Some universities will be offering in-person career fairs um, and our hope is that the in-person career fairs will be returning at a larger scale in, in the coming months as well. Um, so career fairs are, are activities in which you will see employers with many booths um, within a, a space and you'll have the chance to talk to employer representatives. And it's often that first opportunity you have to connect with a representative as well. The, the interesting thing about our career fairs, you don't have a lot of time. You probably have maybe five minutes, if you're lucky, to really share about who you are and so forth. And what Career Services does is they will help you prepare for those career fairs through various workshops and advising. And they also will help you prepare for individual employer visits as well. Uh, next slide. So there are a number of job search tools that exist within career centers. And most schools these days, I think will be offering a platform called Handshake. Um, Handshake uh, is a separate company that serves career centers. And essentially what Handshake is or, or its competitors is it's a job search platform. It's a way to, it's a way to 
uh, search for internships. It's a way to search for jobs. It's also a way to, it's also utilized often for on-campus interviewing as well. So for example, you may have companies that are um, uh, providing on-campus interviews. You're going to be signing up for those interviews through a platform like Handshake. So it does a lot of different things. Um, at IIT, we actually use Handshake to manage our CPT process as well. So we use it as, a, as almost a CRM um, as well. So uh, it, is, it is a platform um, to really become familiar with and to one that you want to utilize. Now, there's other platforms out there in addition to Handshake, but that's just one that uh, I wanted to, to highlight. Other uh, digital technologies can include things such as interview stream, which really is a platform that allows you uh, to gain additional interview prep. Parker Dooley is a platform that offers micro internships or so shorter term experiences. And then there's platforms that um, are really catered more towards international students um, that will really showcase, okay, where have international students obtained different positions prior? So you can get a sense of who's hired Previously, previously as well. And going global does a little bit of, of that. Um, there's so many more platforms I could highlight. At IIT, we have a platform called VMOC, which actually is an art artificial intelligence tool that reviews your resume within 30 seconds and provides feedback based upon your area of study. But most career centers will offer very similar digital technologies. And it's, it's, it's great to utilize uh, because you can do it at any time of day or night. Next slide. So I've talked a little bit about working on campus um, and, and Holly stated it as well. So I won't uh, talk in depth there, but I think the one thing I wanna emphasize that it can vary from campus to campus. And there's a lot of different positions. They can range from working and catering to housing, which relates to campus and residence life, research in some cases. There could be customer service positions. You could be events-based. You could be working in the library. At IIT, uh, positions exist within all these, these different areas for our international students. Now, the one thing to consider is it's not a guarantee to get an on-campus job. Similar in some ways to an internship um, through CPT, you still have to get that job offer. And in some cases, there are multiple candidates, both international and domestic, for these positions as well. So while many of our international students do obtain on-campus positions, uh, I think at most schools, it is not necessarily a guarantee, although it is a great way to, to, get, to gain some experience and earn some additional money. Next slide. So in summary, um, job search tips. Um, one, outside the classroom, and Holly and I stated this, engage in the student life experience. Um, we didn't really talk too much about the, the, the student life experience outside of career services, but there's a lot that, that can be offered. There's student organizations, there are student clubs. Um, if you live on campus, there's programming through uh, the residence halls. Really engage in those out of classroom experiences because that's gonna allow you to grow. That's gonna allow you to be more well-rounded and that's going to be very attractive to employers as well when it comes time to interview for those internships that you may be, be seeking. Gain experience as well. Um, I think one of the reasons for curricular practical training is it's tied into your academic study. And uh, often to be competitive for a full-time position, uh, employers are looking for internship experience as well. So that's where the CPT process in particular can be very beneficial to you is because it allows you to gain that experience prior to seeking that full-time position. Really understand your career goals coming into your area of study as well. Um, I, I think, you know, as Holly, as Holly said, it's, you know, you, you, you're on kind of a high when you come in. You know, you've been accepted. You've got that visa in hand. Uh, but, as it, but, you know, as it gets closer, um, you also, you know, even though you may have two plus years of study ahead of you, you really have want to have that goal in mind as well, because what do you what it, what actually is it that you want to obtain as well once you you graduate? So having those career goals in mind, I think, is really really important. And this is where career services can really play an important role in helping you both understand what's available, helping you articulate your career goals to the employers, and uh, being able to navigate that that job search. And that ties into branding and marketing yourself to to employers. 
So you are your own brand as well. And you do have to market yourself to employers. And we, you want to do it in a way that is, um, that is, um, that's very much um, unique to who you are. Um, you, you have many experiences that I think make it very powerful um, in terms of how you can market yourself to employers. The international student experience cannot be, be replaced. Um, so for example, articulating you know, how you navigated a new university, a new culture within the United States, um, even living on campus, for example, those are all things that could be very attractive to an employer uh, because it shows risk-taking, it shows uh, navigating difficult circumstances, um, it shows um, really being able to work with ambiguity. Uh, all these things can be attractive to employers. However, you wanna do it in a way that really is attractive to the employer. And again, this is where career services can help because they're gonna have a specific language that they're probably um, looking for in terms of skills that they're seeking and things like that. And career advisors can really help you articulate that as well. Um, so that's really what I wanted to present. Um, thank you for uh, really sticking with me despite my technical challenges. Um, it's much appreciated. And I think it's now time for the Q&A. Janet. Thank you before, so much. Yes, Holly. Before we do the Q&A, I just want to emphasize the one point that T made and kind of grow from that, because I think that's something we haven't covered yet. The engagement part is critical, not only in the student life, but in the community life as well. And this is where I think you will gain a lot. So in, engaging with the Indian Student Association, I think is critical, but also in the community. So, you know, things that you have done growing up in India, for example, you know, if you are going to the mandir or to the temple or to the Gurdwara or to the mosque, make sure you find your mandir and your mosque and Gurdwara in the Chicago area or in the Phoenix area. Go there because, because that's something you've done in the past, but now you, you're kind of connecting with a new community and you never know what will come out of that. So that's very, very important. Don't forget that part. You know, I mean, that's, that's critical. And then this is where you will also engage with the alumni, folks who are, say, from IIT that graduated five years or 10 years or ASU that graduated 15 years back. They're still in the community and they are well-known people. They will be the ones who will be providing you, you know, various options of uh, professional development and future career. So back to you. Jen. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to say that's a really good point to engage with the alumni. I actually was on a call last night with our International Alumni Committee as well had representatives representing uh, countries from all around the world, actually. And um, so uh, we, we do work to, to help you um, find those, those opportunities to, to engage. Thank you so much, Thi and Holly. Uh, that was uh, such a great information that you have shared with our uh, students. And before going uh, to the Q&A, a quick uh, you know, look at the centers which are there in India. You can take a screenshot of uh, this particular slide, which will help you to reach out to your nearest education USS center, where you can talk about your plans. You can meet the, you can virtually meet the advisors, uh, you know, talk about your profile and they are definitely happy to help you to plan further and, you know, help you in getting the timelines done for the US higher education processes. Uh, also, uh, these are the contact details of uh, Holly Singh and T. So you can also take a note of it. If you have a very specific question about the institution that they represent, and if you want to reach out to them, feel free to do that. Uh, you can also reach out to Education USA Ahmedabad on this particular email ID where you have questions about the processes or you want to know more about the US higher education system. So going further, uh, T and Holi will uh, now take the questions of the attendees. Our first question is, can the master students or the postgraduate students avail the opportunity of student assistantship or maybe various assistantships right in the first semester once they start with their studies at the US campus? Both of you can share your ideas on this. Okay, that's a very good question. So if I understand the question, this is about obtaining um, an assistantship or, or something related to, to that. I would say it's gonna vary from university to university as far as the opportunities available. It could be available. Um, it, it's probably going to be very department specific um, from, from what I've seen in terms of what, what is available as well. Um, and if I could add to T, I think that's something I told the student who asked this question was, 
you know, uh, an assistantship is literally guaranteed when you go into a PhD program most of the time. At the graduate level, at the master's program, you know, it is, it is a benefit, but it's not guaranteed right away. They, the department really wants to, you know, see what your expertise are, you know, what you can do. And, and I think they would reserve that assistantship for the second semester or third semester once they know what abilities you bring in. They rarely provide that in a master's program right away from the first semester. That said, there are many other opportunities on campus that are not just on campus employment, but something called a management intern. That's you know, something that we have in, in ASU. And you know, apart from hiring many international students, I have management intern positions in my office where it's not, just, it's not a student position, it's more like a staff position and gives a tuition benefit. So, so many, there are many other avenues that you can try if you're looking for assistantships, whether they are uh, kind of uh, your academic, your major specific, or some skill that you have that other departments could probably use. Thank yeah. you, Jen. Yeah, exactly, exactly, Holly. One thing I want to mention is that my prior institution at IIT, um, we, we had a large degree of master's degree um, uh, students. And um, assistantships were certainly not guaranteed for master's level students, but they did apply. So even within my department within career services, we always hired one or two um, through an assistantship that gave a tuition benefit, but it was a competitive process. And uh, we often did reserve it, you know, for individuals that had a little bit more experience as well. So. Right, right. I think there's a part of, uh, uh, you know, my next question, which you have answered, probably you can just talk in detail. What factors should one keep in mind while they're exploring the CPT, OPT, or maybe the co-op opportunities on campus? And is a prior work experience going to be beneficial for the student? So if you can just share your thoughts on this. Um, yes, you know, I, I would to, to, to start with the, the last part of the question, prior experience can be very helpful. Particularly at the master's level, I've worked with a number of students that had full-time work experience. Um, for example, with the, with the company in, in India, just as an example, I've seen that on so many occasions. And that experience can be really helpful, both in terms of the name recognition of the company, but also the, the type of position that that individual or student had as well. Um, things to consider in terms of the search can be just the availability of positions, the timeline, um, it can really vary in terms of when companies are hiring both for internships and full-time. Um, the other thing we really haven't talked about too much is the labor market as well. Um, the labor market uh, in the United States as well as just around the world can really vary depending upon what is happening. So um, a year ago, um, things were very hard for a lot of individuals. We had students around the country and at IIT losing internship opportunities because of the pandemic. Um, this year, things are much better. They're still not quite back to normal yet, um, but things are much stronger and we have a much stronger labor market. So that can vary as well. Um, and so, so those are all considerations um, when, um, when uh, starting that, that search. I think the biggest culture shock, Janet, that the students would have is that no employer is gonna come to the campus and give you a job. Our Indian students are used to, you know, employers coming on the campus saying, oh, you got a job, you got a job, you got a job. There's nothing like that. You know, it's your own work, your own resume building, your own way to connect with an employer that will get you a job. So from that perspective, to, to really manage this culture shock that, you know, you have to do the work. I think the two key words are preparing and planning constantly prepare, constantly plan. This is where T's team and my team would be very helpful to students in helping them prepare and plan because they have to have the conversation with the employer and they have to be able to tell the employer that, hey, I, am, um, I could be a meaningful em employee of your company. So that is very, very important. Right, right, true. Uh, the next question is from Aditya and he wants to know that, uh, what is a typical duration of a CPT program? Like how many months a student can think of working on a CPT? Well, it, it can vary depending upon um, when you're doing the CPT as well. And this can vary even within institutions. So 
think Holly stated this earlier, some institutions may not offer CPT during you know, the fall or spring semester. Um, at IIT, we do, um, but, but it, it, it's gonna look a little bit different. Um, in the summer, which is when a lot of students um, will probably utilize CPT at a lot of institutions, um, you know, I would say the typical duration is probably about 10, 10 to 12 weeks or so. Um, and a lot of it will be centered around even the, the, the program as well or the internship program that you're going into. So some companies, particularly larger companies, will have very structured internship programs that have very defined start and end dates as well. So it, you, the duration could be dictated by that too. Um, but typically in the summer, um, you know, I would see probably you know, 10, 10 to 12 weeks or so um, on average um, in terms of the duration. I've seen it shorter, you know, um, as short as four weeks in some cases. Um, but the other thing to consider is, you know, what level of experience do you want to obtain as well? Um, and so uh, both can be valuable, um, but it can really vary. So, so to build on what T is saying, and in short term, we understand, you know, four weeks could be short term, but long term could be, so if you start your academic journey in fall 2021, you get an opportunity in summer 2022 to work with a company and you work 40 hours the whole summer. And that company says, you know, we like your work. Why don't you finish your semester in fall 2022? And if see if that department will let you continue part-time your CPT. And maybe that department lets you continue. And come December, once your degree is completed, they may hire you back on OPT. I mean, that's the, uh, that could be a, a, you know, an exceptional case, but that for our Indian students who are on top of their game, that could be a reality as well, that you go right from an internship to an OPT opportunity that could flourish for the next three years, because you know if it's in the STEM field, it can go for another two years after the 12 months of OPT. Right. And, and how does the you know, CPT duration affect the OPT later on? So you, if you can talk about that particularly. So there, there are no particular effects of CPT uh, on OPT unless you do 12 months of full-time CPT, which okay. really does a person do because they understand that if you're getting closer to that limit of 12 months of full-time CPT, that they will lose the opportunity of OPT. And usually departments don't like, you know, to give 12 months of full-time uh, CPT or full-time internship either, because that means that student is not really taking classes per se, and they're dedicating full-time to uh, to a work opportunity, and and I would I would not recommend that. I think I would recommend, as as T and I are both emphasizing, academics is central, and whatever employment opportunities that is related to your your academics, that's what you want to do, and that's why just a summer internship uh, in a CPT fashion is good because then you are then you're related to an employer that may even hire you once your OPT starts. See? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. You know, academics is central. Um, I think the advisors will very, very much be knowledgeable. And I think in most cases, they will give you some very direct advice of what you should be doing um, when it comes to navigating, you know, the timelines or the duration of CPT versus OPT as well. Because in the end, you know, they're going to be, they're, they're, we're here to provide you support. And we're looking um, both at the short term and long term for you to be successful. And I don't think any advisor would want to put you in the position where you're not able to utilize your OPT as well, if that's available to you, um, because that would be uh, truly a disservice as well, so. Right, right. And, and the student wants to know that, uh, is CPT uh, given to all the student, uh, you know, who is pursuing their education on campus? Do you have a kind of success ratio that how many students are getting the CPTs usually? I think, I think it's very important for the student to understand that CPT is an academic benefit. It yeah. is related to your academic major. It's related to the department that you are studying in. And many departments may not even have the CPT or this internship provision. So, so again, it is, it is fully academically related benefit. And this is where if a department does not allow you to do CPT because it has to be an integral part of your degree program, you could do pre-completion OPT. And that's where I think it's very important for the student once they, they're on campus to understand that difference and work through that. 
Right. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, no, I agree completely with, with, with Holly. I think I think it's a lot of it is about understanding your your department that you're studying within as well. That's going to be key. And I think your um, connection to your academic advisor in many cases will be an important aspect to understand what is available um, and what potentially could, could be offered. Um, we haven't talked too much about academic advisors today, but they can play a crucial role in this as well. Yeah, um, at IIT, for example, um, we have a couple levels of approval for CPT. Um, so um, a first level approval is through career services, um, but then there is an approval required through the academic advisor as well. Um, and that's all built into our uh, handshake module. Um, so both of those things need to happen in order to be able to um, fulfill the experience. Yeah, same. Yeah. I think that'll be true for many of the universities because as, as T said that the academic advisor, the academic de department is critical in the approval of a, of a CPT in an approval of an internship. Right, right. Uh, and we'll take the one last question. Uh, what is a core programs? Usually oh, okay. we hear more about it. You know, the students are also aware because there are certain university which put it up as a part of the curriculum, right? So yeah, are the co-op yeah. programs, if you can talk yeah. more about it. Yeah, I can speak to that. I help. I actually used to help run co-op programs. Um, and so I, I've got probably more um, knowledge than, than um, folks would want to know about with co-op. Um, but um, I, the first thing I want to start with is co-op can be interpreted a lot of different ways. And so universities, just like uh, CPT, can interpret co-op in different ways. Um, but generally speaking, I think about co-op as an extended experience, as an extended experience that alternates work experience with full-time study. Um, so for example, it could be you have a co-op that starts in summer. So you work full-time in summer and then you're back in school in the fall semester, spring semester, then you're back in a co-op experience as well. So it allows you to obtain extended experience with an individual company as well. Um, so some schools have very formalized co-op programs Others have more informal co-op programs as well. Um, typically, at least from my experience, co-op programs tend to be, this is not always the case, but tend to be um, very um, directed towards engineering type companies and, and, and uh, disciplines as well. That's, that's what I've seen. And that's, that's what I was involved with previously. Ali, over to you if you want to add something. I, I think, yeah, I mean, this is T, T's got the experience behind the co op. So, you know, I, I co op is more work focused, a work focus that is still part of the academics, whereas internships and CPD in a way are less so because the focus is more on the academic side. Mm -hmm. And that could be that co op can be sometimes even be um, separated further on. So, uh, in a co op, degree bachelor's degree for example instead of taking a typical four year could take a five year time because the co-op program asks them to take one fall semester attached with their summer out and then another spring semester attached with the summer out of purely doing work you know 40 hours of work and and that's where sometimes there's there might be more flexibility on the off-campus work and a large larger time for off-campus work than a typical internship or a CPT. Yeah, I agree. Co-op, you know, um, could be very difficult to do as a master's degree student, um, yes. just because of your duration of study as well. So mm -hmm. uh, there could be more flexibility if you're an um, a undergraduate student to obtain a co-op experience, so. Right. Thank you, thank you so much. That was a, such an informative session and I'm sure the students have gotten certain takeaways regarding what could be the outside classroom opportunities that they can explore and how they it's going to affect the rules and the regulations about it being an f1 you know a visa holder so thank you so much holly thank you so much the it was nice having you as a speaker for this particular session we have shared your details with our students and i'm sure the students will reach out to you directly for further questions if they have uh, so thank you so much and we'll hope to see you soon again with Education USA for further more sessions. Thank you so much everyone for joining in. Without you, it would not have been possible to have such a successful session. Wish you all the very best and do reach out to Education USA if you have further more queries about your US higher education process. 
Thank you so much and good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Great. Bye. And Holly, great meeting you as well. So same here, T. Yeah. All right. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. bye, -bye. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Janet.